Okay, it's time to get started. So we'll continue branch prediction uh, today and hopefully we'll finish it quickly and we'll move to new ex uh, other execution models. Can you hear me well? Good, okay. Okay, I guess before we start, uh, are you guys aware of the new row hammer attacks that are being publicized? No? If you're interested in this, since you know about row hammer now, you should take a look for sure. Let me show you. There are two articles that cover it. There's a paper that covers it also, but let me see if I can find this. There you go. This is one. Can you see that? Ah, not that one. Yeah, this one is an example over here which basically, uh, there are some researchers, one of whom actually sometimes comes to class because he's visiting us here at ETH. They've developed a method of uh, enabling row hammer uh, through the GPU that's integrated into existing systems, existing mobile systems, and they can essentially uh, do a row hammer attack very quickly on the, uh, with the use of that GPU uh, and essentially take over the system. It's, it's nice, you can go and uh, read it, and the paper is linked from here somewhere. Let's see, I don't know if I can see the paper. Yeah, there you go. You can actually click on this and find the paper also, if you're interested in that. Yeah, there's another uh, coverage of this also on Wired. So if you want to see something that you studied at the beginning of this course, yeah, I don't like the title not that much maybe, but <laughs> essentially it's the same, same story. How do you do a row hammer attack using uh, the GPU? Okay, I'll leave you with that because if you keep on talking about row hammer, that'll be, now it'll be a full uh, class perhaps. <laughs> okay, uh, let's get back. We'll talk about branch prediction. Uh, and this is just to jog your memory. Keep reading. This is, this is not, these are, none of these are new readings. I've talked about this yesterday and I'm going to We've already covered actually some pictures from this yesterday because it's an insightful paper that talks about why different branch prediction mechanisms actually work. Today, hopefully we'll get to VLIW and maybe fine-grained multi-threading, but before I'd like to wrap up branch prediction, it's such an important topic, it's going to be even more important for the reasons we discussed uh, yesterday, right? 80% accuracy is not good, 95 is not good, 97 is not good. If you want to build a much uh, uh, bigger machine, wider and deeper. And this was uh, the state-of-the-art branch predictor in 1997 or so when this processor was designed. As you can see, it's already complicated. And these things have gotten more complicated. And there's some in interesting information over here. You see that minimum branch penalty was seven cycles. That's the minimum time it took re to resolve uh, the branches. And this was a four-wide machine. So it's, it's really 28-cycle penalty, maybe a little bit more because of some buffering in the front. And the typical branch penalty was 11 plus cycles based on their latencies of the loads. That's what they say at least. Uh, and you can see that the iCache is your BTB in this case. They store the target addresses in the iCache and they uh, reset the predictor tables on a context switch because some other program is starting and they don't want to use the branch information, uh, prediction information for uh, that program from a previous program. Okay. So I'll, uh, I, I already said this basically, are we done with branch prediction? And the answer is no, <laughs> there's a lot more to do. As you can see, uh, with this sort of prediction, the maximum IPC is nine uh, GCC, if you have unlimited resources uh, for, for the GCC workload, and maximum IPC with perfect prediction is 35, maybe even higher depending on what assumptions you make. So there are other branch predictors that are developed. I'm gonna go through some of these relatively quickly. I'll give you the key ideas so that you're familiar with them. Uh, these are going to be relatively advanced. Actually, this is really not advanced. Loop branch detector and predictor. Basically, existing machines have mechanisms to detect loops and predict them very accurately. This is a really old idea. In the 1960s, IBM processors, uh, IBM 36091, what they did was they didn't just predict loops, they just captured the loops, and they actually had a loop buffer where they could execute the loop uh, directly uh, from that buffer. But existing machines uh, operate like this. They have loop iteration count detectors, predictors. Uh, and this usually works well with small number of iterations where iteration count is predictable. If it's hard to predict, then you have a problem, of course. And Intel Pentium M has this. I think existing Intel processors also have it. Perceptron, we will talk a little bit about. This is uh, an example of machine learning impacting the design of hardware architecture. 
Essentially, the perceptron predictor learns the direct correlations between individual branches, and we will see that uh, in a little bit. There's also, this is kind of the state of the art hybrid history line predictor. Basically, it uses different tables with different history lines. So far, we've seen one global uh, uh, history register indexed into one single table. You can capture the history length that global history register can encode, but actually some uh, people have found out, uh, Andre Sesnik from in INRIA uh, in France has found out that it's, there's benefit to having multiple tables with different history lengths. In fact, there's benefit to having geometric history length, geometrically increasing history lengths in the tables. That way you can predict the branches better. Okay, so this is one example of existing mechanisms uh, in Intel processors. You can see the loop detector logic here. They figure out what's the count of the loop, uh, what iteration count you're at, what is the limit, and what should your prediction be based on that. It's a very simple predictor that learns from past behavior again. And this is an indirect branch predictor. If you have time, we'll talk about that also. Because indirect branches are harder to predict because you, you may have multiple target addresses. Okay, let's talk about perceptron because this is interesting. Uh, has anybody heard about perceptrons before? No? No one? No machine learning classes yet? But you may, talk, you may uh, learn about it. This is one of the simplest forms of machine learning, actually. It's, it was developed in uh, late 1950s, early 1960s, and I'm going to reference a book uh, about that. It's essentially a simplified model of a biological neuron. People were very uh, enticed with the fact that, oh, how can we model uh, how can we mimic uh, human beings, human neural system, and how can we design systems based on that? And perceptron was one of the earliest ideas. It's called perceptron because it's supposed to perceive, and the perception it makes is very simple perception. It's a binary classifier. Is this a dog or is it a cat? Right. That sort of binary classification tasks. Should this branch be predicted taken or not taken? Right. Dog versus cat. There is a correlation there. Right. Okay, so basically what it does is uh, it maps an input vector x to a 0 or 1. Input is a vector x. This is a vector of, uh, I don't know, could be many things. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example over here. But perceptron learns a linear function, if one exists, of how each element of the vector affects the output. Right. And this is stored in an internal weight vector. So it basically learns the weights. And the output is weight vector multiplied by dot product uh, by this x vector, input vector x, and there's some bias vector. If that's greater than zero, then it classifies it as, I don't know, a dog. Otherwise, it classifies it as a cat, right? So there's a training function where it learns this, these weights, and there's, a, uh, there's also an inference function. This is the inference function where it infers what the output should be based on the input and the weights it learns. It also learns the bias, but I'm not going to talk about the bias. So bias is each, each of these elements has a bias. So in the branch prediction context, which is the context that we're dealing with, vector x is essentially the branch history register bits. Each bit in the branch history register, global history register, is uh, an input. And you can express it as a vector. It's actually a vector, right? A 16-bit branch history register is a 16-bit 16, 16 vector. And the output is prediction for the current branch. That's essentially it. This very simple form of machine learning applied to branch prediction. So how does it work? This is the pictorial form. This is y is the output, uh, and there's a bias uh, weight over here. These are the weights that the perceptron learns, and these are the inputs that you have at that point in time. So this is the inference function. We're going to look at the training function a little bit. Uh, and essentially, you do a, a dot product uh, uh, multiplication over here. Sigma x, xi, wi. Uh, you multiply them and you add the bias on top of that, that's your output. And you compare the output to greater than zero or less than or equal to zero. So that's the idea. In the branch prediction context, we use a perceptron to learn uh, the correlations between branch history register bits and branch outcome. These weights are essentially how correlated uh, this, branch out this branch's outcome is to the bit that we're examining, which is if you have 16 bits, you're looking at bits, I don't know, one over here, right? That's the idea. And you learn these weights for all of them. Maybe there is no correlation between one bit and this branch that you're currently predicting, then the weight for that would be zero. Maybe there's a positive correlation, the weight would be very high. Maybe there's a negative correlation, then the weight would be very low, negative uh, number. And we already said this, basically. So each branch is associated with a perceptron. And a perceptron contains a set of weights, wi. Each weight corresponds to a bit in the global history register. So you can think of these x's as bits in the global history register. And how much the bit is correlated with the direction of the branch. 
So there's a positive correlation. I already said all of these, actually. I don't want to repeat it. <laughs> but basically, the way you need to do this is you need to express global history register bits as 1 and minus 1, taken or not taken, and take the dot product of the global history register that you currently have with the weights that you've currently accumulated. And if the output is greater than 0, you predict the branch as taken. If it's less than or equal to 0, you predict it as not taken. So this is a little bit more sophisticated what we've seen before, right? Before, we took the global history register index into a table and looked at the last outcome. We never tried to learn how each of these bits in the in different locations of the global history register is correlated with the outcome for that particular branch. And this is a paper that introduced the idea uh, in modern times, and this is actually the book that introduced the perceptron uh, for the first time. OK, so how do you implement it? Uh, I didn't talk about the training function, but this is the training function. After you, after you figure out the outcome of a branch, you look at your prediction and update the weights accordingly. Uh, essentially, this, you, you look at how correlated this branch is to all of the bits uh, in the global history register when you actually did the, made the prediction. It's simple. You can look at it yourself. So every, every neural network has to have a training function and an inference function. This is the inference function that we use over here. So you can see that uh, with the branch address, we index an entry, index a table of perceptrons. Uh, you get a perceptron for that particular branch. And if you're actually predicting it, you compute this y function over here and generate a prediction. Once the uh, branch is resolved, you input that outcome into the training function over here and also what you've computed, what your uh, prediction was, and also the bits coming from uh, the perceptron. And then you recompute the weights, essentially. That's the idea. And there's a bias weight, which I didn't talk about so far. This, is, this actually corresponds to the bias of the branch. This is independent of the history. It's set. Uh, it can also be learned. Uh, and this is the dot product of global history register and perceptron weights, and the output is compared to 0. That's the idea. And it turns out this actually, uh, if you have a global, uh, uh, global predictor uh, with a single global history register, this is much more accurate. I've actually built this myself. And I've seen that this is much more accurate uh, than global history. It reduces the branch misprediction rate by about 20 to 30 percent compared to a simple global history register that doesn't do this, this sort of learning. Sounds cool? Yeah. <laughs> OK. So what are the advantages? The advantage is more sophisticated learning mechanism. As a result, you get better accuracy, actually. The disadvantage is it's hard to implement. So if you go back. You need an adder tree to compute perceptron outputs, right? This is essentially uh, an adder tree that you need. Uh, and another addition, all of this is a tree, actually, in the end. And to do the training, you need to do some more. But training is usually not on the critical path. This is on the critical path because you need to generate a prediction in the single cycle when you're fetching this branch. OK, and there are other disadvantages also. It turns out perceptron is a linear uh, separator. It's, it's, it, it makes this binary classification based on a linear decision. So it can only learn these linearly separable uh, classification tasks. For example, XOR is not a linearly separable function. You can, there is no linear cut that you can have uh, between the input values and the output values. As a result, you cannot learn XOR type of correlation uh, with, with perceptrons, with this sort of perceptrons. People have developed multi-layer perceptrons and other neural networks that can learn these sort of linearly non-separable functions also. But that goes into a lot of theory. And we're not going to talk about that. So it cannot learn everything, basically. You can, uh, you can keep, this, uh, uh, keep that just over here. That's true for all machine learning tasks, but it cannot learn very simple uh, functions also, as you can see over here. And you can actually convince yourself that it cannot learn XOR by looking at the linear weights, right? OK. Any questions? OK, let's look at more state of the art. This is actually uh, very close to the state of the art, but people have figured out to do even better. Uh, and it turns out prediction using multiple history lengths uh, with some, a lot of other uh, stuff to correct that prediction turns out to be the best performing predictor so far. So the observation here is uh, different branches require different history lengths to, for better prediction accuracy. And this makes sense, because if you look at this particular branch, let's say it's correlated with the immediately produced branch. But it's not correlated with anything else. Let's assume you, you look at another branch that's correlated with a branch that's 500 branches before. That's possible, because you're testing some condition 500 branches before, and you're maybe testing a similar condition 500 branches later. And in between, there's a loop that has 400 branches, let's say. Right? So there's a lot of correlation that happens 
that may not be captured with a single history length, but they can be captured with multiple history lengths. And the idea is very simple, once you have this observation, have multiple tables, pattern history tables, indexed with global history registers that have different history lengths, and intelligently allocate entries to different branches. I'm not going to go over the decisions of how you actually do this allocation, but it looks like this, basically. You have this particular uh, table that's indexed with some history length, length one, another table that's indexed with another length two. These are longer histories now. They get progressively longer as you go to the right. And they all generate some predictions, may or may not. Uh, and there's a base predictor that's really simple. So it's a hybrid predictor by nature, as you can see. And you pick the prediction of the best one. And it, I think in this case, uh, it really depends. There, there must be some, there are some confidence bits that determine, oh, this predictor is doing well, or this predictor is doing well, or this predictor is doing well. So now this sounds like black magic maybe, right? It's, it's actually a lot of art and modeling and also science that goes into it, but it's not an easy task to figure out exactly what, what, what should be the optimal thing. But it turns out this actually performs quite well. Uh, and this is part of uh, the best performing predictors that are implemented in uh, existing machines. So existing machines are, of course, more complicated. This is just a key idea that you improve upon. So if you really want to learn what's, uh, what are some of the uh, what are some of the best predictors out there? You should take a look at these championships that are held once in a while on branch prediction. For example, this was the state of the art in 2016, I think. Uh, as you can see over here, this is the main Tage predictor. Tage predictor is what we've seen over here, predictor with the multiple history lengths. And on top of that, you get a prediction and some confidence, but that's not enough. You basically do some statistical analysis, a correlation analysis over here very quickly in hardware. And with you taking into account some other histories, local, skeleton, global, whatever you would like. If you really want to learn, you should really look at the papers over here. And there's a separate loop predictor because loops are, you don't want to predict, easy to predict branches over here. You really want to reserve these resources for harder to predict branches and loops are easy to predict. Okay. Okay, so we've talked about confidence a little bit. Confidence is actually very common uh, to use in branch predictors. This one has a confidence. Oh, this, uh, so if you go back over here, these U-bits, some of these indicate, oh, this predictor is highly confident uh, because it's done quite well in the past or for some other reason, for some other contextual reason. Uh, confidence is essentially an estimation of the likelihood of how good your prediction is. Is it going to be correct or is it going to be incorrect? And you could do this for your entire prediction you could do this for a part of your branch predictor, as we've seen. You could do this for, uh, again, uh, if you have heterogeneous branch prediction mechanisms, hybrid branch prediction mechanisms, for some of the prediction mechanisms, and decide which one is more confident. And there are ma many methods uh, of doing it. I'm not going to go into this, but I'm going to go into the why you would like to do it. Because it could be very useful in deciding how to specul speculate. Um, how to speculate can have many, many options, right? Which predictor to choose? if you have a hybrid predictor or if you have different tables in your predictor, whether to keep patching on this path. Maybe you just stop fetching, right? If you think you're not confident, you just stop fetching and do nothing until you resolve the branch. Right? That may be a good idea. That may be the energy efficient option, right? Uh, or whether you switch to some other way of handling the branch. If the predictor is not doing well, oh, well, maybe you should do a dual path execution, which we briefly talked about. We're going to talk a little bit more about today. Or maybe you do something like predication. We'll talk about that briefly also. Uh, so basically, this gives you a lot of options, right? It gives you the uh, power of choice. That's why confidence estimation is important. Now, how to do that, I'm not going to go into that. But one way, of, one way you could imagine is you can, you can see how good your predictions have been in a given predictor and use that as your confidence, right, over time. You need to use some other information than the prediction information that you have. <laughs> because otherwise, you'll be redundant and you, you cannot affect your outcome, right? Okay, any questions? This is fun, right? So I've given you the almost state of the art in branch prediction, but uh, this is actually a topic where, uh, that, that affected a lot of uh, processor designs. And if you're an expert in this, you'll be very highly sought after. <laughs> I know some people who, who were paid a lot to design some big machines branch predictors. <laughs> okay, there are other ways of handling uh, branches. Uh, let's talk about some of them. I mean, we've, we've seen stalling the pipeline, terrible idea. We've seen branch prediction, good idea, but you need to be careful. Uh, and we're going to see the delay slots, not, as, not such a good idea, I'll tell you, uh, to begin with. But it's very instructive to see these ideas. The idea over here is very simple. 
instead of having the semantics of the branch, this branch, after it's executed, you immediately go to the next instruction. Next, uh, if, if, you, if your target is something far away, you go there. If your target is not something far away, you get to the next sequential instruction. That's our semantics, right? The next instruction that's executed is either on the fall-through path or uh, uh, on the target path. But why don't we change the semantics of the branch instruction? As opposed to branching right now, branch after you actually fetch and execute n other instructions. Right? Or branch after you fetch and execute n cycles. So you don't immediately do it, you do it in a delayed fashion. Now what this gives you is you can fill those delay slots with independent instructions from wherever you find them. Right? That's the idea. Delay the execution of a branch, n instructions that come after the branch are always executed regardless of the branch direction. We've changed the semantics now. Branch doesn't take effect right now. Branch takes effect after n instructions. And if your branch is resolved by then, no problem. Right? You're done. You've filled the pipeline with those n instructions. Yes? That means you need to fetch n more instructions in order to analyze whether they're independent and whether you can run them. No, uh, the compiler puts those instructions that are independent. <laughs> it's the compiler's job. <laughs> but you have a good idea, yes. <laughs> You could potentially do this in hardware also, but that will be complicated. But when this was first proposed, you do it at the software level. So yeah, basically you, you answered, uh, you, you helped me answer this question. The problem is how do you find instructions to fill the delay slots? Branch must be independent of the delay slot instructions. And uh, basically the compiler, the software finds those instructions. So if it's an unconditional branch, this is relatively easy. It's easier to find instructions to the, for the delay slot because you could, you could put stuff from the target right, into those delay slots because you're going to jump to that target anyway and you're going to execute those instructions. Conditional branch, now condition computation should not depend on instructions of the delay slots, clearly, right? Because you're going to compute the condition of the branch, start the branching process, branches in the machine, and the next n instructions should be completely independent of the branch. So it's difficult to fill the delay, delay slots uh, if you have a conditional branch. Let's take a look at first uh, an example of this. Let's assume we have a simple two-stage pipeline, fetch and execute, and we have this normal code. These are instructions, instruction A, B, C. C is dependent on A, and branch is dependent on C. B is independent over here. Now let's take a look at the execution of this code over here. So it's a simple pipeline. When you get to the branch, you don't know what to fetch. Let's assume that. Uh, so this is a bubble. And branch eventually is taken, so you fetch G. So you get a one cycle bubble over here. In six cycles, you fetch, uh, I don't know, five instructions, I think, right? Yeah, five instructions here. Uh, now, if you want to get rid of this bubble, you have a one cycle delay slot. You specify this in your instructions at architecture. My branch takes effect after one cycle, or after one instruction, let's say, in this case. And what you can do over here is you see that this B is independent. The branch is independent of the B. And B is independent of A and C also, so you can actually move this B into the delay slot. And once you do this, and once you change the semantics of your branch instruction, you don't need any branch prediction, right? Once you fetch this branch, you fetch this one, and you know that it's going to be executed because you've defined the semantics that way. And branch takes effect after one cycle, and there's no need for prediction. Make sense? So this is five cycles. You've gained, uh, I don't know, one out of six uh, like a 16% performance. Not bad with a two-stage two pipeline, right? And you don't need any branch prediction hardware anymore. Sounds good. <laughs> so it's a cool idea. Uh, I mean, people have developed this idea. In Spark, for example, you have this delayed branching, but they also have something called delayed branch with squashing. So it turns out it's not always easy to fill this delay slot. What if these were all dependent on each other? There was nothing, uh, there, there, there would be nothing you could put into the delay slot, and what does the compiler do in that case? The famous instruction no op, right? It puts a no op, no operation. Now you're back to square one. No op is not, it doesn't count as a useful instruction, right? It increases your number of instructions, but it's not a useful instruction. So basically, that's the problem with this approach. You need to fill uh, these delay slots, and if you cannot fill them, there's a big problem actually. And there we will see other problems because normally delay slots should not be one cycle, right? What if you have a deeper pipeline? Are you going to have 20 cycle delay slots? Actually, compilers have difficulty filling one cycle delay slots. And if you now require 20 cycles or 20 instructions to be filled, good luck. 
That's the difficulty of this approach. Okay, but uh, some people had some clever idea uh, in Spark. Uh, they said if the, uh, there's a branch instruction that has this semantics. If the branch falls through, i.e. it's not taken, the delay slot instruction is not executed. Now we're making things a little bit more complex. So you need to check the branch condition to do the squashing. So why? Because they figured out it was very difficult to fill the delay slot. This is one example. Right? I just said this. These, uh, these instructions are all dependent on each other. It's a dependency chain. You cannot fill the instruction, uh, the delay slot in delayed branch code, so you add a no-op over here. But if you had delayed branch with squashing, you don't need to have that no-op. This is a loop. You could fill the next instruction to be the first instruction in the loop. And if the branch is taken, that's good. You execute the instruction in the next iteration of the loop. This is assuming that loop iterations are independent, of course. Right? Well, actually, it doesn't matter, right? You could actually, loop iterations can be dependent, but this will still get the value. So it works fine, actually. But if the branch is not taken, you need to squash this, clearly, because you actually need to go to this instruction over here in that case. Then that's why you have this instruction in your ISA, delayed branch with squashing. Now, this is not very satisfying, right? Because essentially, you've introduced a squash, which means that you need to have the logic inside there to squash that instruction, right? So it's partially branch prediction here, but it's software-based branch prediction in a sense. So not so great, maybe. Well, let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of this. So the, advantage, the big advantage is you keep the pipeline full with useful instructions in a simple way, not requiring branch prediction, assuming, that, assuming two critical things. Number of delay slots is the same as the number of instructions to keep the pipeline full before the branch resolves. And as I said, maybe with one cycle delay slot, it's okay. With 20 cycles, 30 cycles, 50 cycles, a variable number of cycles in out-of-order machines, you have a huge problem. You cannot fill the delay slot. Not fill the delay slot. You, can, uh, you, you cannot have that many number of delay slots. And uh, also, what is the number of delay slots that you should put into your ISA? Now, the big problem with the number one over here is you tie your architectural definition to a microarchitecture. Right? Microarchitecture normally should be independent of your architectural definition. You should be able to say, oh, I have a five-stage pipeline without exposing that to anyone. I have a 10-stage pipeline. I implement out-of-order execution today. Tomorrow, I could do something else. But if you have an instruction that specifies your delay slot is only one or five or 10, you have to fill those delay slots and you change your microarchitecture, you still need to handle the delay slot, but you also need to handle the branches on top of that. So for example, delay slot is, uh, all of these machines, Spark machines, uh, need to deal with this today. They have a delay slot of one instruction. It's essentially useless. Spark architectures, uh, uh, Spark, uh, mm, Spark, you have out of order Spark machines that are built, and you can see that the pipeline length is 12 cycles. So what does the hardware designer now need to do? Ensure that the delay slot semantics are obeyed. That's true for MIPS also, by the way. MIPS has a delay slot, but we ignored it so far. Uh, delay slot is obeyed. And also, branches are predicted fine. So you add, uh, people add branch prediction on top of this idea. So it doesn't solve a problem. Though it has a fundamental, uh, not so nice, uh, uh, mm, uh, not so nice, not so clean interface between the ISA and the microarchitecture because it really ties the, micro, the ISA to the microarchitecture. So on top of this, any, all delay slots uh, should be filled with useful instructions, and this is a tough thing to do, and we will see that in a little bit also. So basically, this advantage is not easy to fill the delay slots, even with a two-stage pipeline, uh, and number of delay slots increase with pipeline depth and superscalar execution width. We can do the same calculation. If your pipeline depth is 20 and superscalar execution width is five, you have 100 delay slots. And number of delay slots should be variable with variable latency operations because you have out of order execution, right? You don't know when the, uh, you can actually fill uh, the machine with lots of instructions. But there's no easy way to specify this in the ISA. Okay, I already said this actually. The ISA semantics, it ties the ISA semantics to the hardware implementation. And these machines all need to deal with this ISA semantics today. It's just a headache to the hardware designer without buying anything. Well, maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe it buys just this much. 0.1% potentially, but not really. Okay. Okay, so how do you fill the delay slot? We didn't really have a lecture on static instruction scheduling, but hopefully you can uh, do that in uh, your other courses. Uh, 
But let me give you an example. Basically, you need to reorder instructions. For example, if you have this sort of, uh, this is, let's assume that this is one example. Uh, you have this add instruction. And add instruction is independent of the branch. And the branch is independent of the add, clearly. Uh, so you can move this add over here within the same basic block. So this is good. We, moving instructions within the same basic block is easy. Basic block is a block of instructions. Uh, when you enter it, it gets executed until the end, unless there are exceptions, which means that there is no control flow change within the, that can happen within the basic block. It's a sequential uh, set of instructions without any branches. It starts with a branch target. It ends with a branch. Uh, so if the movement is within the basic block, that's not bad. But sometimes you cannot find instructions within the basic block. So in this case, for example, uh, you have this branch over here. This is a target. Uh, instruction, target address, and this is the previous instruction. This is not good. You cannot move the S. Uh, you cannot move the add because add is actually, uh, uh, the branch is actually dependent on the add's destination register. So you cannot move that safely. But, but you can move this target over here into the delay slot. Now you have a problem. What if the branch is not taken, right? If the branch is taken, that's good. You execute this instruction. You move that instruction, it's independent. But if the branch is not taken, you need to compensate for it. You did the subtract. On the non-taken path, you need to undo the subtract. So this is the dilemma with almost all compiler-based optimization. If you move the code from the target of the branch to the same basic block as the branch, which is what we're doing by filling this delay slot, you need to undo what you will do in this basic block if the branch is not really taken. That's called code compensation. All compilers need to do this correctly. Uh, and of course, it really depends on this instruction over here. Sometimes you cannot undo some effects, right? If it's a, load if it's a store instruction, for example, you've got to be very careful. So it's usually harder to move store instructions that store to memory. OK, and this is a similar issue over here. This is uh, uh, the branch over here. You have a delay slot over here. Uh, OK, I don't know what happened over here. But basically, this is from the, this, you're filling it from the not taken path, you, which means that you need to add a new instruction to the taken path if the branch is taken. Right? That's the idea. You need to compensate for what you've done. If the branch goes this way, you fill the delay slot. But what if the branch goes that way? In that case, you actually need to uh, compensate for what you did. And always, you need to question, what's the safety? Is it safe to move this instruction? Will it cause an exception, for example? Or will it actually? really write to memory. So there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of um, limitations on how much code you can move from one place to another while, uh, while preserving both sequential semantics and what the programmer really expects. So a compiler, uh, ensuring that your compiler is correct actually takes a lot of effort. OK. OK, let's look at something else, uh, which is predicate execution. We actually talked about this briefly. I'm going to cover it uh, in a little bit more detail, but not too much more. We talked about this combining, predicate combining. So I just want to show the slide. I didn't have a slide yesterday. But this is not predicate execution. It's not the same thing as predicate execution. Predic predicate combining, as we've said, uh, is an optimization that you can do as a programmer or a compiler can do. For example, if you have this uh, complex predicate, this can be converged into three conditional branches, as you can see. That increases the number of control dependencies. The idea was to combine predicate operations to feed a single branch instruction instead of having one branch for each. You saw this yesterday. The uh, predicates are stored and operated on using condition registers. You could use general purpose registers for this also, but people have provided special condition registers that are only available for the branches to test, such that you can actually do this really quickly in the ISA. A single branch checks the value of the combined predicate. It, you don't have three branches checking this. Now, the upside is there are fewer branches in the code, fewer mispredictions, fewer stalls. That's great. Now, the downside, as you've seen, is possibly unnecessary work. For example, if the first predicate is false, there's really no reason to execute anything else over here, right? If A is equal to B, uh, if it's not true, then you should really not take this branch. You know that immediately. And this has been actually employed in many architectures. IBM Power architecture, for example, RS6000, they have these condition registers. You can operate on these condition registers. These are special registers, especially to do this condition uh, computation in the system. Sounds like fun, right? OK. OK. So let's talk about what is predicated execution. That was what is not predicated execution. This is uh, predicate combining. 
So what is predicate execution? This is an idea that's been employed actually in all processors that I know of in a limited form. And some processors were fully predicated. ARM was fully predicated until the version 8, for example. The idea is very simple, to convert the control flow dependence to a data flow dependence. Very fundamental. In fact, it was first developed as a technique to optimize code in compilation in 1983. They said that, oh, these control flow dependencies are not good for us when, I op when we optimize code, just because of the reason that I just showed you, right? If you move code, you need to do compensation code. You need to add compensation code to the not taken path. And the fundamental problem is there's a branch over there. People said, if we get rid of that branch, we could do compiler optimizations much better because we know how to deal with data dependencies really easily. Branches just add more dependencies that we have to deal with. So I get, let's get rid of these, all, these headaches. Right? Then if you con con convert the branch into a data dependence, then that's great. So basically, the simple example, suppose we had a conditional move instruction. Conditionally move R2 into R1 based on some condition. This condition could be a condition code, a condition register, or you test a general purpose register. If this is true, move R2 into R1. That's predicated execution, essentially. Have you seen this statement? Has anybody programmed this way in C or any other language? Basically, you can do this in some languages. Uh, if the condition is true, R2 is the one that gets assigned. If the condition is false, that's the, after the colon, R1 is the one that gets assigned over here. That's how we can implement this. Basically, if the condition is true, R1 gets R2. If the condition is false, R1 gets R1, which is the old value of R1. So this is a conditional move. It's employed in most modern ISA. x86, for example, has it. And this is a very good way of getting rid of very short branches, especially if you're testing if condition do this, and then that's it. You get rid of that if branch that way. So let's look at code examples with branches versus conditional modes. This is if A equals 5, B should be set to 4. Otherwise, B should be set to 3. So you could turn this into branches, or you could do this conditional move. Basically, you compare equal into a condition register, A and 5. The condition register is true if A is equal to 5. Otherwise, it's false. And they have a conditional move instruction. Based on the condition register, uh, it moves 4 to B. If this is true, this is done. And you have a conditional move instruction that tests the opposite condition and moves 3 into B. Now, if the condition register is set to 2 over here, this will take effect. 4 will be moved into B. If the condition register is false based on this condition computation, this will essentially not take effect. It's essentially a no-op, right? This gets converted to a no-op in that case. Now we've gotten rid of the branch, though. Right? There is no single branch over here. It's all data dependence. <laughs> Make sense? Any questions? <laughs> OK. <laughs> so you can do this in your code as a programmer. Right? There's nothing that prevents you from doing this. You can get rid of the branches in your program this way. That's a possibility. But of course, if you do it this way, this is a lot easier to program if you're thinking sequential, for example. If you're thinking data flow, this is how you'd, you would really program. So I think most of people here are probably thinking sequential. So they would be more comfortable with this if-else statement. But this is really data flow principles again, right? In data flow, there are no branches. Everything is data. Uh, uh, everything is basically data dependence, right? There is no control dependence in data flow, if you think about it. OK, so another example of data flow principles going into uh, the architecture, as you can see. OK, so the idea is, of course, not everyone is thinking about data flow. So people have said, oh, compiler should do this. Compiler eliminates the control flow dependence into data dependence. Branches eliminate it. Now, you need support in the instruction set architecture. Instruction set architecture should have a predicate bit that is set based on predicate computation in each instruction. Only instructions with true predicates are execute it and commit it. Otherwise, they're turned into no-ops, just like we've seen. So let's take a look at this example over here. This is if some condition, you set B to 0. Otherwise, you set B to 1. And this is a normal branch code. This is the control flow graph, as you can see. And these are three different basic blocks that you have. Predicated code, there is no control flow. It's all data flow. You set a predicate register based on the condition. And this, is, this could be your ISA semantics. Right? 
If the condition is not true, then you move one to B. If the condition is true, then you move to zero to B. You've gotten rid of the control flow of dependence. Now you can move code nicely and freely while obeying just the data dependencies. And that was the initial motivation for this. And you can actually have the next thing that's coming after that, right? Okay, so if you're really interested, you can read this paper that introduced this. Uh, but let's take a look at conditional move operations a little bit. Uh, this is a very limited form of predicate execution, as you said. Uh, it's employed in most modern ISAs, and this could actually make things very efficient. Let's take a look at one example. If you have this really short branch, let's say, if then else, if you use predicate execution, what you would do is you would really fetch things this way, right? You fetch, uh, this is not the predicate code, it should be A, B, C, D, E, F. It's really straight line code. That's what you would fetch. This is the branch version of the code. But when you execute it in predicate manner, this would become a no-op. That's good. You don't need to do branch prediction. You just no-op this one. But if you were doing branch prediction and if you mispredicted, your branch predictor said, oh, I should go this path, whereas you should have gone this path, you get a huge pipeline flush. That's how I, this can be very energy efficient if you do it right. So if, it's a, if this is a branch that's predicted, that's very likely to be predicted correctly, there is an overhead of no-op, right? Predictor would have done much better. If this is a branch that's very hard to predict, this no-op may be worth it, right? Because otherwise you would get this huge pipeline flush. So it, now it's the compiler's job to figure out which branch actually should get this predicated code. Okay. So we've also said this, it eliminates branches, it enables straight line code, larger basic blocks in code. Let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of this. Hard to predict branches can be eliminated. So how to do this, the compiler algorithms, there are many, many sophisticated compiler algorithms that, are, that have been developed, I'm not gonna go into that. Always not taken prediction works better. We've said this, right? If you have always not taken prediction, no branches, this is sequential code, that's great. Compiler has more freedom to optimize the code, as we've discussed, because control flow doesn't hinder instruction reordering like we've seen earlier. And code optimizations are hindered only by the data dependencies that you have. There's no control flow that you need to take and take on. Disadvantages, as you've seen, useless work, no ops, basically. Some instructions are fetched and executed, but they're discarded. This is especially bad if your branch is easy to predict. And it requires additional ISA and hardware support, clearly. Uh, and one question is, can we eliminate all branches this way? I will argue, yes, because data flow works. But if you have a sequential program with loops, it's very, very hard to eliminate the backward branches this way. You need to change your ISA to be able to eliminate all branches this way. If you already have a backward branch, backward branches are very difficult to eliminate. You can think about this. <laughs> okay, versus branch prediction. Uh, I'll finish predicate execution and we'll take a break. Uh, so essentially, this eliminates predictions for hard to predict branches. This is great, no need for branch prediction. But somebody needs to do the analysis of this, basically. Is the misprediction cost greater than useless work due to predication? That analysis is not easy. And it causes useless work for branches that are easy to predict. It reduces performance if the misprediction cost is less than the useless work. Right. So people have tried to make this more adaptive uh, because if you do this statically without any adaptivity, it turns out branch behavior changes based on input set, program phase, control flow path, and you cannot adapt to any of these. And predication doesn't gain performance that much. Although there are other benefits of predication, like code optimization, right? Okay, so this, is, this was employed in Intel Itanium. Intel Itanium, you, many of you don't know it, it still exists in some market domain. This was Intel's attempt to have a 64-bit architecture, ISA. They completely changed the ISA, and they failed in the general market space. AMD had the x86-64 ISA, which was an incremental addition to the x86, and Intel had to adopt AMD's ISA, essentially, to go forward with their designs. But this was a very bold attempt. Essentially, they had each instruction had a predicate register. They could be separately predicated. As you can see, there were 64 one-bit predicate registers, and you would carry a six-bit predicate field. Which predicates are you dependent on? You could be dependent on six different predicates to be able to execute, right? If all of these predicates are true, then execute this instruction. What is this good for? What if you actually have complex control flow? You don't, you don't just test if and else, but you have a complex control flow graph. There are many ifs and else's. You can set many different predicates. So it's very powerful, actually. But an, effect, an instruction is effectively a no-op if its predicate is false. So you can see that this code becomes this code over here. So you got rid of the branches. It turns out this is actually a shorter code also. I'll, I'll give you another example. So almost all ARM instructions 
uh, uh, can include an optional condition code prior to ARMv8 architecture. ARMv8 got rid of predicate execution. Apparently, they didn't see a lot of benefit from it. I'm not sure. You could uh, talk to the ARM folks. But an instruction with a condition code is executed only if the condition code flags in the, uh, this processor status register meet the specified condition. I'll give you just an example. So this, was, this is not the current ARM ISA. This is the old ARM ISA. They had these condition codes. And part of the reason they got rid of this is condition codes, as you can see, occupy space, right? This is four bits in Intel uh, IA64, it was six bits. And if you're not gaining a lot of benefits, what are these four bits really for, right? Uh, so I'm, you don't need to know all of this, but you can see these are the different uh, conditions that these test. For example, this one is testing if the zero condition code is set. This one is testing if the overflow condition code is test, set. And you can see that greater than, less than, always. So if an instruction should be always executed, uh, regardless of the condition code, you should basically set it to 1110. Right? That's unconditional instruction. So everything else is really a conditional instruction. If you do this, I guess you get an error in, in the decoder. So this, uh, these slides go through an example of how you would actually do conditional execution. Basically, you need to postfix with an appropriate condition. Uh, this way, basically, the, to execute this only if the zero flag is set, uh, you have an add EQ, right? If the zero flag is set, execute this add. That's the idea. This is add always. That's add all. But add EQ, EQ means execute this add only if the zero flag is set. Uh, and to set the condition flags, that's what you do, basically. So you, you have these versions of add that is testing and setting flags. And they have an example over here where you could implement the greatest common denominator algorithm. I don't know if the algorithm is perfectly correct here, but that's OK. You, this is supposed to find the greatest common denominator of these two numbers, assuming there are multiple, one is a multiple of the other. <laughs> there are no additional checks that are done if they're not a multiple of the other, I think, over here. But it's a simple code with lots of branches uh, over here. And this is a branch version of the code with the normal assembler that uses just branches. You see that there's one branch, one branch, one branch, one branch, four branches over here. With predicate execution, it's only four instructions. You got rid of all the branches. Uh, yeah, actually, you got rid of all the branches, and the remaining instructions are your instructions. I guess you have uh, the, the last branch, whether you reach the end over here. For whatever reason, they included it over here because uh, they were over here to begin with. So this is the power of predicate execution, as you can see. It can reduce your code size as well, at least in this case. Now, this is not the common case. If you have very complex control flow graphs, it could increase your code size also because of all the predicate computation that you need to do. OK, so this is a really good place uh, to take a 10-minute break. And we'll be back to talk about multipath execution. <laughs> OK, let's get started. Uh, so we'll finish uh, branch prediction. Well, we finished branch prediction, actually. We we're looking at other methods of handling branches. We we're going to finish them and then jump to VLIW and fine-grained multithreading. So this is the last piece I'm going to cover. This is another fascinating idea that fascinates a lot of people, uh, multipath execution. So fetch from both path possible paths when you get to a branch, if you know the addresses of both possible paths, of course, right, target addresses. Uh, it's called multipath execution, and it's a really old idea, actually. Execute both paths after a branch. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this a lot, because you need to keep both paths context what if you reach another path? What if you reach another path? We discussed this very briefly last time. But the big, uh, this is, if you do it for a hard to predict branch, this may be a good idea. You use dynamic confidence estimation, as we've discussed, right? If the branch is very, very not confident, you, if you're not very confident in your prediction, maybe go both paths, right? You're going to discard one path, of course, uh, at some point. This is a similar idea to predication, but it's not exactly that way. This is done in purely hardware, if you think about it. There is no predication that happens in the code. You don't change the ISA for this. The advantage is it improves, well, I know ISA change is needed. It improves performance if misprediction cost is, again, greater than useless work. Because you definitely do useless work by going through both paths. And there are a bunch of disadvantages. What, if, what happens when the machine encounters another hard to predict branch? Do you execute both paths again? Paths followed quickly become exponential if you have lots of hard to predict branches in your code at that point in time. So there's a danger. And if you think about the overhead of keeping each path, you need a register file for each path, or at least the differences. Whatever you write, you need to keep store it. 
You need to ensure that the paths do not interfere with each other because you're going to execute only one of them. So there are a lot of issues in hardware design over here. As we've said over here, registers, PC, global history register. Global history register is needed because you take different branches on each path and you need to predict them correctly. And there's a lot of wasted work if paths merge. So that's the idea over here. Uh, now I've, seen, I've known uh, processors, IBM RS6000, for example, uh, would fetch from both paths, but wouldn't execute uh, from both paths. So it had a branch prediction. It would uh, go through the path that's predicted, but it would also fetch the path that's not predicted, just in case. If you're wrong, you would quickly supply the instructions into the pipeline, but it wouldn't go and execute those paths uh, until you know the branch. So let's look at the differences between dual path execution versus predication. Let's assume that you get to a hard to predict branch. What dual path execution does is, it does this. It essentially creates two paths uh, in the pipeline. It executes them. Well, as you can see, it really executes D, E, and F multiple times, right? Now, they're not exactly the same instructions because the data values in C and B may have modified how these instructions have uh, executed over here, right? Because you, you executed C over here, which created a register 2, which is different from the register 2 that's over here, perhaps. That may not always be true also, right? It really depends on what happens in C and B. But you're clearly fetching and executing some redundant instructions. But if you had predicated execution, if the compiler actually compiled the code such that it knew that it predicated this, you would be executing C and B together. You could think of predicated execution as executing from both paths, except you have a single uh, sequential piece of code, right? The compiler essentially merged these paths together, so you would execute C, B, D, E, F, or B, C, D, E, F, or a version of B, C, uh, reordered, and then D, E, F, right? So predicate execution is actually more efficient, as you can see over here, because with dual path execution, you're executing really both paths. Okay, so that's the last idea. You could combine all of these ideas, which we're not going to get into. But let's talk about different branches. We've talked about conditional branches a lot. Conditional branches are interesting. You need a binary decision uh, which way you go. But there are other types of branches, if you remember. Uh, returns and indirect branches are branches with many target addresses, as you can see. Calls are easier. These branches, uh, as you can see, the, um, the target addresses are only one over here. So that's easy. But many target addresses is a problem. And there's also conditional indirect branches, which are not over here. Those are not used in many ISAs, but you could potentially have them. And those are the biggest headaches if it's conditional and indirect. Right. OK, so let's look at call and returns first. Call and returns are actually easy if the programmer obeys some standards, meaning you do calls, and then you have a return for each call. So every a return is nested in the call. So direct calls are easy to predict. They're always taken single targets. You mark the call in the branch target buffer, and the target is predicted by the branch target buffer. That's easy. So you can actually do this, basically. Let's assume that this is a recursive call. Call x, do something, call x, do something, call x, do something. And then returns correspond to the calls. This is nice, right? It doesn't have to be recursive, clearly. Uh, so returns are interesting because they're indirect branches, right? Whenever you do the call, you store uh, the, the target address that you're going to return to, which is the next sequential instructions address, in a, in a register or in a stack, and then you, you do a return on that, right? So there are indirect branches because call may come from many sites in the code. Returns need to return to the correct site. This return needs to return here. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, exactly. This return needs to return to the call site. This return needs to, needs to return to this call site over here, and this return needs to return to that call site. So a return instruction can have many target addresses, next instruction after each call point for the same function, essentially. The observation is that if you program nicely, you have a return for each call, right? The corresponding return. As a result, in the hardware, you can use a stack to predict the return addresses. Whenever you fetch a call instruction, you push the return address on the stack. Whenever you fetch another call instruction, you push the return address on the stack. You keep doing this. And then whenever you see a return, you take the return address on the top of the stack, and that's your prediction, essentially. That's the idea. So it's very simple, assuming returns match the calls. Make sense? So you do a bunch of function calls, and you return from them that way. And if you have this sort of structure, 
it turns out an eight entry stack buys you a lot of accuracy, 95% uh, accuracy. So eight entry stack means you can do, you can push eight return addresses onto the stack. And if your call depth is more than eight, well, you have a problem with an eight entry stack, right? You will not be able to support that call depth in the hardware. So a lot of machines that are out there today have 32 entry stacks, for example. Uh, even those can overflow. Uh, but if you're programming nicely, you always have a matching return for a call, and the stack works nicely, essentially. Okay, so that was easy. The harder part is the indirect branches that are register indirect that are not part of, that are not returns, essentially. Uh, register indirect branches have multiple targets. So far, we've been dealing with conditional or direct branches. It has one target and one next sequential instruction. But an indirect branch may look like this, basically. You load some value from memory, that's a pointer, and you jump into that pointer uh, that is essentially the beginning of your code, right? It could be many things. Then the key question is how do you predict that? Well, this, could, this is actually used to implement many, many statements, virtual function calls, for example. Uh, they go through a virtual table that determine what is the target address that you should load uh, into your program counter. Jump tables of function pointers, interface calls, these are all, all modern language, uh, uh, languages that have these indirect calls. I'm not going to go into these. Uh, but switch case statements, they're actually in less modern languages also, but they could be implemented with, uh, with a table that you consult, and that table gives you the address that you jumped, essentially. So for example, uh, virtual function calls are usually implemented based on the object type. You have a virtual V table, virtual function table. You know the object type when you're actually uh, executing the program, and each object type has essentially an entry. For example, let's say you're, you're computing the shape, you're computing the area of an object. Object could be rectangle, square, rhombus, trapezoid, dot, dot, dot. Each of them have an entry in the virtual function table for the area function, and each of them have a number. So at runtime, you figure out, oh, this is actually a trapezoid, so I should index the trapezoid entry for in that V table, and that entry gives me the target address that I should jump to. So you have a table of target addresses that correspond to the locations of the different area functions. Each area function is specialized to the object that you're dealing with. That's how things are implemented in uh, object-oriented languages. As a result, you have these indirect branches that are very, very handy. If you don't have indirect branches, you have to check everything, right? You have to say, oh, is this object a square? If this object is a square, jump here. Is this object uh, uh, a rectangle? If it's a rectangle, jump here. So it's a huge if and else statement. If you have this indirect branch, you index into a table and get the, uh, get the target address uh, immediately. That's why indirect branches are very useful for implementing this sort of uh, thing. Okay, so the upside is there is no direction predictions needed, but you have a bigger problem at hand, which is uh, the target prediction. So what people have developed a lot of ideas. I'm not gonna go through the same thing that I did, but I'll give you two ideas. You can predict the last resolved target as the next fetch address, right? This is last time this indirect branch was executed. It had a target address that you computed. Use the same one. It's like last target prediction. Uh, and you can actually use the BTB to do this. You don't need additional hardware because BTB already does this. You just, you just need to record the indirect branch targets last time they were executed inside the BTB. It turns out this is very inaccurate. It's about 50%. Many indirect branches switch between different targets, especially with modern languages. If you look at the past programs with old languages, you get 50%. If you look into the future, that 50% is actually lower. Right? Uh, the other idea is using history-based target prediction. Basically, the ideas that we developed are very fundamental. And people have, for example, developed a G-share type predictor. Uh, if you remember G-share, you take uh, the branch program counter and you XOR it with the global history register, and you can index a BTB, branch target buffer, with that, and that gives you a target address. Now you take into account program counter, as well as history of the branch, and that history of the branch correlates with, let's say, the object type, or what target address you should choose. So there's a correlation over there also. That's what this exploits. It's more accurate, it's about 70%. Uh, but it, one downside is actually causes a lot of pollution in the BTB, because an indirect branch now maps to many entries in the BTB. So one downside is, so there are some indirect branches that have only one target dynamically. There are some indirect branches that have many, many targets. 
uh, here, an indirect branch that has a single target actually maps to many entries because it actually gets executed with different histories. So you, have, you actually have some problem over here. Okay, you can read that on your own. But existing architectures actually implement indirect branch predictors. Uh, so they, they, have, they don't really describe it exactly, but it's a history-based predictor that uh, gets a target address from the BTB or a history-based mechanism uh, that stores the target addresses over here. This is Intel Pentium M. AMD actually has their own predictors also. They had a large uh, table uh, of target addresses to keep the indirect branches, uh, branch target addresses. Okay, so those are different branches. I didn't uh, spend a lot of time on these, but know that these exist. They're becoming increasingly important, especially indirect branches, because they're very useful, uh, and they need to be handled somehow. So, okay, let's have some finishing thoughts on branch prediction. So we've already said that you need to identify a branch before it's fetched. How is it done? You should know this very well. Basically, you consult the BTB, right? If the BTB is a hit, that means that the fetched instruction is a branch. If the BTB is a miss, then you don't know. It may be a branch that's, uh, that's just executing for the first time. It may be a branch that got evicted from the BTB, right? Uh, and BTB entry contains the type of the branch, and you can use this type information to select between different predictors, right? The type could be call, the type could be whatever, right? Uh, that way you select between different predictors. And you need to do all of this in one cycle when you're fetching the instruction. People have pipelined this, but pipelining doesn't help in this case because in the next cycle, you still need to fetch the instruction that you need, right, in the next cycle. So it's actually uh, dangerous to pipeline the fetch engine. You need to be a little bit clever in how, to, how you pipeline this. Okay, so, or you could actually identify uh, the information of the branch type inside the instruction cache by pre-decoding it. We've discussed this very briefly. What if you don't have a BTB, or what if you don't do this pre-decoding? Well, tough luck. You have a bubble in the pipeline <laughs> until the target address is computed. Basically, you want to move the target address computation, or you want to remember the target address as early as possible in the pipeline. Otherwise, you have a bubble in the pipeline, and some, pe some people actually made this choice uh, explicitly, for example, IBM Power 4, when they designed it, they said we want high frequency and we cannot get this target address. We cannot get this BTB in there. We want a large BTB also. So tough luck. We're going to tolerate that bu bubble in the pipeline. Doesn't sound great, <laughs> always. <laughs> but they later, I think, fixed it in later, later machines, actually. They don't have that uh, choice anymore. Okay, so uh, this points out uh, everything we've discussed makes branch prediction logic very complex, right? But latency is also very critical. Prediction latency is very important because you need to generate the next fetch address uh, for the next cycle. You need to get a fetch address at the end of this cycle so that you can latch it into the program counter. And bigger, more complex predictors are more accurate, but they're also slower. So how do you actually trade off uh, this? So if you look at the next fetch address, lots of things feed into this, right? There may be more, depending on your branch instruction types. And you need some logic to decide this. And this is your critical path on your front end. So how do existing machines do this? It's actually uh, interesting because the existing machines have multiple different predictors. Some of them are simple, less accurate. They do a quick prediction for the first cycle. And some other predictors take longer. And uh, if this other predictor, longer predictor, longer, uh, slower and more accurate predictor has a prediction that's more confident, or that's different from the faster predictor, in the next few cycles, you override the prediction, have a small pipeline flush, just because your bigger predictor thinks that this branch shouldn't have been predicted the way the small predictor actually predicted it. Make sense? So you could actually have these hierarchy of predictors, some of them small, fast, some of them large and more complicated and slow, and when you get a more confident prediction, you have a choice right now. Do I, do I trust this predictor and flush the pipeline, have a little pipeline flush, and refetch from the target that this predictor thinks is good, or do I just keep going and trust the smaller predictor? Now, usually trusting the bigger predictor helps, but you need to have a confidence mechanism over there also. So that's how they get rid of this, uh, not get rid of, but overcome this huge latency bottleneck. Because if you put a huge predictor over there, that's going to affect your cycle time immediately. And this is one of the tight loops in the pipeline. There are these loops or microarchitectural loops in the pipeline, which means that you need to produce a value and you need to consume the value in the next cycle. Next fetch address is one of those values. 
There's another loop, which is a data dependency loop. You need to produce uh, the output of an instruction, and the dependent instructions need to consume that output. That's the data dependency loop, right? But this is actually a much tighter loop over here. OK, so hopefully this interests you. Uh, there's a lot more interesting stuff to do underneath, but we don't have time for it. Any questions on anything related to branches? Now you have a new mechanism to predict the branches? Not yet. <laughs> Maybe after you take the machine learning class. <laughs> OK, so we're done with branches. The reason we covered branches is they're so fundamental to everything that we've covered so far. Basically, if you want to have a good out-of-order superscalar pipeline machine, you have to have a good branch predictor. There is no way out of it. <laughs> That's why people have developed branch predictors for decades and decades. VLIW is interesting. Uh, so VLIW, you don't really need to have a great branch predictor in hardware, but you need to have really good guesses in software. <laughs> so you may need to actually eliminate branches heavily. So for predicate execution is employed heavily in VLIW engines for the reasons that I'm going to discuss uh, in a little bit. So what is VLIW? Does anybody know the expanded version of the term? Has anybody programmed digital signal processors from TI, for example? A lot of those are VLIW engines. So VLIW means very long instruction word. It's a very simple word, actually. Uh, the instruction is long. <laughs> so we, uh, I'll contrast with superscalar. Superscalar means you hardware fetches multiple instructions and check the, checks dependencies between them, right? We were able to fetch four instructions per cycle. Existing machines can fetch eight instructions per cycle and checks dependencies between them to ensure which one can execute, which one cannot execute, right? That's the idea of superscalar. The LIW idea is essentially the same. You can fetch multiple instructions, except the compiler packs independent instructions together such that the hardware doesn't need to do anything. That's the idea. Well, anything meaning actually it doesn't check the dependencies, right? Basically, the software compiler or the programmer ensures that independent instructions are packed together in a larger instruction bundle such that they're fetched and they can be executed concurrently without checking dependencies across these instructions. That's the idea. Very simple. Very similar to superscalar, except uh, it differs in who does the dependency checking, as you can see. OK, we said this. Hardware fetches and executes the instructions in the bundle concurrently. There is no need for hardware dependency checking between concurrently fetched instructions in the VLIW model. So you can visualize it this way. It was actually introduced by Josh Fisher in this paper where, uh, where he introduced the enormously long word instructions. It's basically 512 bits. The instructions that we're dealing with, MIPS, is 32 bits, right? Now we have 512 bits. But if you think about it, you can visualize it this way. You have a program counter. If you go to the program counter, you fetch multiple instructions that are bundled together. And the compiler ensures that these instructions are independent of each other. And they get fetched, and they get directly fed to the processing elements that can process them. So now the compiler needs to know how wide you're fetching. The compiler is tied to the microarchitecture over here. And the ISA definition is partially also tied to the microarchitecture. So is it a good idea? Is it not a good idea? In this case, it's a big trade-off. Basically, you simplify the hardware a lot by doing this. You get rid of a lot of dependency checking. But now you put a lot of burden on the compiler. And the compiler needs to find independent instructions to pack together. Right? So a lot of compiler techniques have been developed to figure out how do we find these independent instructions to feed this machine. And actually, a lot of the compiler uh, algorithms that we see in the compilers today are developed because of this reason. So because these machines existed, and they still exist, compiler technology improved significantly. And I'll tell you more about that. So, but if you look over here, uh, there are other things that you can do with this. For example, if you don't have homo homogeneous processing elements, this is an adder, this is a multiplier. Well, it cannot be a multiplier. This is a, it's an adder, this is a load uh, memory unit. This is an ALU, this is another ALU. If the memory unit is only here, the compiler can also ensure that memory instructions can be only in this position when you fetch them in the instruction. That way, you don't need to do anything in hardware, actually. The compiler knows how things are connected to which units and ensure that the instructions are aligned to those units. That way, you don't need to have any wires going from here, from this ALU. Let's assume that this was the load unit and you had a load over here. You, don't, you need a wire to supply that load to here. But if the compiler knew about this, 
it wouldn't put a load over here. Now you could eliminate that wire, right? There's no reason to have those connections uh, in the front end when you fetch the instructions and how you distribute the instructions into the pipeline. So you can actually simplify the hardware a lot by exposing more to the compiler. Okay, so this is a very long instruction word. It consists of multiple independent instructions packed together by the compiler. Packed instructions can be logically unrelated. They could be doing totally different things as you see over here. This is different from SIMD and vector processors that we will see. In SIMD or single instruction multiple data or vector processors, which is essentially what all GPUs are doing today or most GPUs are doing today, uh, packed instructions specify the same operation. Okay, and we already said this. Compiler finds independent instructions statically, uh, and statically schedules or packs or bundles them into a single VLIW instruction. So traditional characteristics, you want multiple functions. The reason this was developed is you want to be able to execute many instructions per cycle. In fact, we will see that one of the machines had 28 instructions per cycle. Um, one of the other characteristics is all instructions in a bundle are executed in lockstep. Now, what does this mean? If one instruction stalls, all of the instructions stall. This is to simplify the hardware. This is not a great thing because now you cannot tolerate the latencies very well. The compiler needs to be able to tolerate the latencies somehow. Uh, and instructions in a bundle are statically aligned, as we've said, uh, to, to, to be directly fed into the functional units. Let's look at one example over here. It's going to be very obvious with the pipeline that we've shown for superscalar. The pipeline is uh, very similar, but much more simple compared to superscalar. In this case, the compiler optimized the code such that you can execute two instructions per cycle. They're all independent of each other, the two instruction bundles. So you get two IPC, six instructions issued in three cycles. Wonderful, if it works well. Uh, so basically, this lockstep execution that I mentioned, let's cover a little bit more of this. This is all or none execution within a bundle. If any operation within this bundle or VLIW instruction stalls, all of the instructions stall. This is to simplify the hardware. Uh, in a truly VLIW machine, the compiler handles all of these dependency-related stalls, and hardware does not perform dependency checking. That's the idea, actually. That's the philosophy of this. Hardware is extremely simple. Compiler figures it out and gets the most of the hardware, and it's very parallel. Hardware just provides a parallelism. Compiler does the scheduling of the instructions. Extremely different philosophy compared to superscalar, as well as out-of-order execution, right? Out-of-order execution says, I'm not relying on anything in the software. I'm going to reorder the instructions internally, right? Here, the compiler has to reorder the instructions well to be able to make the best out of this machine, right? Uh, which means that if all of the instructions stall, which means that the compiler needs to figure out how to make not all of the instructions stall, right? Now, there's a problem here. What, do you, what if you have variable latency operations? We discussed this earlier. It's very difficult for a compiler or software to predict what is going to be uh, short latency or long latency if you have variable latency. What, what happens sometimes, the memory takes five cycles, 10 cycles, 100 cycles. You have a problem in code scheduling. How many instructions do you need to reorder? You don't know, right? That's the problem, actually. OK, but philosophy is very beautiful. It's very similar to actually the RISC. RISC is simple instructions, uh, reduced instruction set computers. You may have heard of this. Uh, but essentially, RISC was initially introduced by John Koch at IBM. IBM 801 mini computer was the first RISC machine. Uh, later, Spark and MIPS coming out of Berkeley and Stanford uh, were, uh, were actually examples of RISC architectures also. Uh, the difference is VLIW is multiple instructions in parallel. So let's take a look at RISC. The compiler does the hard work to translate a high level language into simple instructions. The idea over here is instructions should be as simple as possible. You should not have a string move operation in your ISA. You should, move, you should have add, and, not. You should not even have a multiply. Initial risk proponents said we should not have a multiply. Later, they figured out that if you do multiply using adds and shifts, it takes a long time. So they added a multiply. Uh, you should not even have different types of loads. Load byte, load word. Who needs load byte? Just use load word. Later, they figured out that, oh, there are a lot of load bytes that people do. So we should have load bytes. But if this is the philosophy, basically. The philosophy is keep the hardware very simple, keep the instructions very simple, punt on the compiler to do the hard work. And this actually generated a lot of work in the compiler domain. So John Koch was actually, his idea was even more extreme. He said the compiler, uh, compiler should be exposed to all of the control signals in the hardware. And the compiler should be controlling all of those control signals. 
Essentially, instructions are not simple in this case, but compile is very complex. Right? OK, so you reorder simple instructions for high performance, and hardware does little translation, little decoding, little reordering. It's very simple. BLIW, very similar concept. Compiler does the hard work to find instruction level parallelism to pack these independent instructions together. And hardware stays as simple and as streamlined as possible. Now you can potentially increase clock frequency, right? Uh, to be very high. And you execute each instruction in a bundle in a lockstep because of that. OK, I already said this. It's simple, higher frequency, easier to design. And this has been the war of the two worlds, if you will. Uh, complex hardware, out of order execution, versus simple hardware. Well, in most general purpose machines, complex hardware won, because it's very difficult to extract parallelism, uh, as, we've, uh, as I'm going to tell you in a little bit. So these were the commercial VLIW machines. Uh, Josh Fisher built actually several machines himself. Uh, he was a professor at Yale, and he decided, I'm going to build machines. Uh, and he did build these machines. Those are very, very interesting machines. Bob Rao, at the same time, was doing uh, very similar things in the side drum. Uh, Transmeta was an example of the LIW machine we talked about. But most successful ones that, are, that were commercially successful are these digital signal processors and embedded processors that you can buy and use. And some of you may be using without knowing it if you have TI calculators, for example. Uh, TI has these, the TriMedia, ST Micro, they all have these VLIW machines. Intel IA64 was an attempt at Intel 64 bit architecture that was not fully VLIW because they knew the downsides of VLIW. Uh, but they, it was based on VLIW principles. They called it explicitly parallel instruction computing, EPIC. Uh, and what they did was they actually violated some VLIW principles so that they don't have the downsides. Basically, instruction bundles could have dependent instructions. So a compiler actually could put some dependent instructions over there. As long as compiler specified, oh, these are the dependent instructions hardware, you can do something with them maybe, because I don't know what to do with them. That's the idea over here. It's a little bit more powerful. But the downside is now the hardware becomes more complex. Uh, and as you can see, a few bits in the instruction format specify explicitly which instructions in the bundle are dependent on which other ones. Now it, it becomes not so nice, right? But there is a reason for this, because you cannot find independent instructions easily in the software. For example, in this 28-byte machine, there were a lot of no-ops, right? We discussed if you cannot find the independent instructions to pack together or reorder, you put no-ops. That's the easy way out. <laughs> but no ops are, don't, don't help your performance. They may help your instruction count. <laughs> By the way, that's a very common mistake in terms of comparing instructions. If you're comparing uh, the performance of two programs, uh, you may have lots of instructions in one program, but they may all be no ops. Right? They may not be doing useful work. So you really should look at the execution time in the end. You have some questions in your optional homeworks related to this at some level. Let's talk about the trade-offs of VLIW. Uh, it has a lot of advantages. No need for dynamic scheduling hardware. Hardware is simple. No need for dependency checking within a VLIW instruction. Again, simple uh, hardware for multiple instruction issue. There's no need for renaming. Superscalar execution goes away, all of that dependency checking logic, which is really the limiter of all of those machines. There's no need for instruction alignment and redistribution after you fetch to different functional units. Actually, we didn't talk about this, but essentially, I said earlier, in a superscalar machine, you need to have kind of like a network, uh, network of wires to ensure that the instruction that you have over here goes to the right functional unit. That's complex, and you get rid of all of that complexity. The disadvantage is very similar to what we've discussed with delayed branching, for example. Compiler needs to find n independent operations per cycle. If it cannot, it inserts no ops in a VLIW instruction. So out of your 28 instruction bundle, Four, 10 maybe no ops. And that reduces your efficiency very quickly. And also, it, it, not only it reduces your efficiency, it reduces your parallelism that you can exploit, but it also increases your code size. Right? You need to encode these no ops somehow. Uh, and one other disadvantage is you're tightly tying uh, uh, your implementation uh, to what the, compile, what the code that's generated is. Right? You need to recompile when you change the execution width when you change the instruction latencies, when you change the functional unit latencies. This is very unlike superscalar processing. Superscalar processing doesn't assume anything from the compiler. Here, if you don't recompile, your program may not run, first of all, depending on how you actually change the machine. Even if your program runs, it may not be efficient. So you really need to recompile to take the best out of the, these machines. 
And that recompilation is actually not easy, as you can see, because you really need to know the latencies, you need to know the machine structure, where is the add unit, where is the multiply unit, where is the load unit, those all need to get exposed to uh, the compiler. So if you look at compilers today, they usually have these machine description files, which you can supply the machine description to. They're actually pre-described. And whenever they generate code, whenever they do machine-specific optimizations, they go through those machine descriptions and try to, do, try to do the right thing for that particular machine. OK. And lockstep execution, unfortunately, causes independent operations to stall. That's a downside over here. No instruction can progress until the longest latency instruction completes. So you see that disadvantages are also serious. And as a result, this is a summary of lots of years of VLIW research. It simplifies hardware, but requires complex compiler techniques. And solely compiler approach of VLIW has several downsides that reduce performance that has not made it successful in the commercial space, at least general commercial space. As you can see, the uh, DSPs, digital signal processors, have actually been successful because they had a niche market. Here are too many knobs, not enough parallelism discovered, static schedule intimately tied to the microarchitecture. As we've seen, code optimized for one generation performs poorly for next. You don't want that in general. Uh, out of order execution nicely tolerates all of that, right? <laughs> and no tolerance for variable or long latency operations. That's the long lockstep problem. Now, the big upside is most compiler optimizations were developed for VLIW machines uh, are now used in optimizing compilers for superscalar machines or for any machine. Because if you actually find these independent instructions, your underlying superscalar hardware and out-of-order hardware is more efficient as well, potentially. Basically, you enable code optimizations. And VLIW is successful when parallelism is easier to find by the compiler. Embedded markets and DSPs, there's a lot of signal uh, parallelism in the signal processing domain. As a result, they have been very successful in exploiting this. Make sense? OK. So actually, the visitor that came uh, uh, on Monday, Wen Mei Hu, did a lot of work on this VLIW compilation. This is actually one of the papers uh, that received a bunch of best paper awards in the past. This is super block. Essentially, that, that was developed to enlarge the blocks such that you could reorder code nicely and easily within a big block. And this is employed in all, uh, uh, all comp compilers that I know of today. They do these super block-based optimizations. And if you're really interested in static instruction scheduling, we're not going to cover it in this lecture, but I have a lecture video about that. And actually, Wenmei uh, did a lot of work. His group, when he started it, the goal was to actually improve performance of these multiple instruction issue processors with an architectural framework and with compiler support. As you can see, it's not just VLIW, it's also superscalar, because superscalar processors can take advantage of it. But VLIW really, really needs it. So as a result of a lot of years of research, you can see the uh, years over here, this is 1991, uh, compilers are what they are because people actually tried to push this idea of simple hardware, complex compiler for decades and decades. OK, any questions? So let me cover the fine-grained multi-threading. This will be a nice input into SIMD machines. Fine-grained multi-threading is a beautiful idea also because it's going to keep the hardware simple but also complex. <laughs> Why simple? It's going to eliminate the dependency checking. Remember, how do you handle data dependencies? We said do something else, meaning there's no need to detect the data dependencies. Switch to something else. How do you handle control dependencies? Oh, that's the wrong one. I don't know how it got there. We need to correct the uh, mistake over here. But clearly, this is a copy-paste error. So there you go. Is that better? <laughs> so you could do something else and get rid of the control dependencies also. Meaning, if, you get to, if, if you're at a branch, don't try to figure out what's the next instruction. Just fetch an instruction that you know is independent from some other thread. That's the idea of fine-grained multi-threading. It's a beautiful idea. It's a very simple idea. It works when you have a lot of threads in the machine. And the idea is hardware has multiple thread contexts. You have multiple program counters, multiple register files, one for each thread. And each cycle, the fetch engine fetches from a different thread, every cycle. You never fetch from the same thread until the instruction of the thread gets out of the pipeline. So you only have one instruction from the same thread in the entire pipeline. Everything else is from different threads. You can see it over here, basically. For example, 
uh, this is the fetch stage, uh, one, when one instruction is being fetched from stream three or thread three, another instruction, uh, it's fetching its operand in stream two, thread two, uh, another instruction from thread one is executing, another instruction from thread eight is executing, another instruction from thread four is storing its result. And there is no single thread that has two instructions at the same time in the pipeline. Now, if you don't have two instructions from a single thread, there's no need to check for data dependencies within a thread. There's no need to predict branches because you're not going to fetch from this thread until the branch is resolved, right? It's beautiful. So by the time the fetch branch or instruction resolves, there's no instruction fetched from the same thread. Which means that another way of thinking about it is the latency of resolution of a branch or any instruction that produces data that's needed by some other instruction, that latency is overlapped with the execution of other threads instructions, independent stuff. Which means that there is no need for handling control and data dependencies within a thread. That's beautiful, you got rid of it. And if you ensure that your threads are completely independent, then there's no need for handling any data dependencies that you have. Sometimes the thread may be dependent on each other if you're doing shared memory multi-programming, uh, multi-threading, but sometimes your threads may be completely independent, right? They may all be operating on different parts of an image, for example. That's why it's a very good model for GPUs. You partition your image, they're all different threads, and all the different threads go into the pipeline, and they all operate on different parts, and you know that they're completely independent of each other. Beautiful. That's why GPUs have been dramatically affected by this, and they operate with this, with this principle. Downside, of course, single thread performance suffers, because you're fetching one instruction into the pipeline every n cycles, where n is the depth of your pipeline. Okay. And also, you need extra logic for keeping thread context. Clearly, you need program counter and registers. And you do not overlap latency if not enough threads, if there are not enough threads to cover the whole pipeline. So this model works really well if there are enough threads to cover the pipeline, right? So we'll see an example of this in a little bit. Oh. Okay, so a little bit, um, yeah, this is the idea, again, posed in a different way. Switch to another thread every cycle such that no two instructions from a thread are in the pipeline concurrently, right? We've already said this, uh, and improves pipeline utilization by taking advantage of multiple threads. And this was actually a really old idea also. This was employed in the first out of order execution processor, CDC 6600, uh, except it was employed to overlap the latency of memory operations. So you could do a memory access, and the memory access takes 10 cycles, and it had a 10 cycle pipeline for that. And you finish, you start a memory access from one thread every cycle. So you need 10 threads to tolerate the latency of memory. So GPUs also use this to tolerate the latency of memory as well. And we will see that. And Burton Smith, uh, who just passed away recently, actually, unfortunately, developed a lot of these ideas and built a lot of machines uh, that, uh, mm, that operate based on these principles. Let's take a look at these very quickly. I already said this, uh, the CDC 6600, it has fine-grained multi-threaded pipelines. A processor executes a different I.O. thread every cycle such that you start a different memory access, they call these the I.O. threads, an operation from the same thread is executed every 10 cycles, right? And they, now you keep the pipeline full with different threads. There is no need for dependency checking. Is this memory operation dependent on the previous one? I don't care. Different threads feed the pipeline and they're all independent. Same here. Uh, there are 120 threads per processor. In this case, 120 thread context you can house in a single processor. GPUs are going to be very similar to this. Uh, and you have queues for available threads and unavailable threads. Some threads get out of the pipeline because they're waiting for data. Now you, you can fetch from other threads. Each thread can have only one instruction in the processor pipeline. Each thread is independent. To each thread, the processor just looks like a non-pipeline machine. Right? You're fetching an instruction every n cycles, basically. So there's a huge trade-off between system throughput versus single thread performance. So if you have only a single thread to execute, this is not going to buy you any performance. Yes. So they have, there are separate register files. I'll, I'll show you an example. So if you're fetching from thread zero, you, have, you go to the register file for thread zero. And that's the hardware cost. That's a good question. Okay, so this is what the machine looks like. The cycle time was 100 nanoseconds. There were eight stages, so 800 nanoseconds to complete an instruction, assuming no memory access. And as you can see, there are these queues. Uh, 
uh, let's start with this queue. So you fetch an instruction, you put the instruction to the queue, and there may be other threads that are waiting to be fetched, but the key is you fetch from uh, a different thread every cycle. Uh, okay, not this one. Sorry, you fetch the instruction, you fetch the operands. Uh, this is not that queue, there's another queue over here that's not shown. You fetch the operands, you perform the function, you store the result, and you go back to the queue to be fetched again. So threads are waiting over here to be fetched. When you remove a thread from the queue, it moves over here and cannot be fetched until it finishes the instruction over here. So threads are just moving. So for example, if, an is, if a thread requires uh, data from memory, it goes into this queue, waits for the memory, and then it gets out, and nothing is fetched from that thread because it, got far, uh, it, it was fetched from this queue and it cannot be fetched again until that thread's instruction comes back and writes its result. It's beautiful, right? And you need 120 threads to tolerate the memory latencies that you have because the memory latency uh, can be long over here. But there's no need for control and data dependency checking, and it was developed by uh, this person, Burton Smith. He was a very good mentor of mine, actually, when I joined Microsoft Research. I had amazing conversations with him. He knew a lot about computer architecture and operating systems, but he passed away very recently. But he actually contributed a lot to the development of these ideas. Okay, uh, so this is the example, to the answer to your question, basically. You have multiple program counters over here, and you have general purpose registers that are per thread. You fetch, and there's a thread selection logic which we're not going to go into. Actually, exi existing processors are also very similar to this, except they don't employ fine-grain multi-threading. And uh, if you look at a super scale out of order processor, they employ multi-threading. But what they don't do is fine-grain. Fine-grain means every cycle you fetch from a different thread. If you do that on a general purpose machine, your single thread performance suffers. So existing processors look like this also, uh, but not, not perfectly like this. But for fine-grained multi-threading, uh, you need separate register files, as you can see. And if you think about now 120 threads, you need 120 register files over here, which means that you have a mux. Right? Of course, you can be more intelligent in the design of this. Okay, so Sun Niagara had similar principles. Uh, this was the, one of the first uh, multi-core machines. The idea was actually very simple, keep the pipeline simple, no data dependency check logic. If you look over here, it could fetch from four different threads. There's a thread select mux, four different buffers for instructions, and their thread select logic selects a thread depending on different things over here, and there's another thread select mux from the instruction buffers over here, and register file times four, as you can see, to uh, distinguish between different threads. And store buffers time four also. So actually you need to multiply these per thread data structures by four in the machine. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of this? The big advantage is there's no need for dependency checking for anything within a single thread, right? Only one instruction in the pipeline from a single thread. No need for branch prediction logic as a result. We got rid of all of that complexity, right? And GPUs are beautiful because they don't have any of that branch prediction and dependency checking complexity. They have other complexities in the memory system. So otherwise, bubble cycles are used for executing useful instructions from different threads. This is looked another way. Otherwise, you would have a bubble. Well, why don't we execute instructions from different threads? You improve system throughput, you improve latency tolerance, and you improve utilization. It's beautiful. Disadvantages, extra hardware complexity, clearly. Uh, and you reduce single thread performance. You should not do this if you're Intel, who is relying on general purpose performance of everywhere in the world, right? But you can do this if you start with a graphics engine, because you already have many, many, many threads to begin with. And your processor becomes simple, and you get high system throughput, so you achieve. So based on your application, this has a lot of benefits or downsides. So of course, you have resource contention between caches, and memory from different threads. You need to handle that somehow. I just experienced that resource contention at Tanambar. I was a thread, and there was a thread of 15 students, and they actually went just, just before me over there, so I got delayed behind, those, <laughs> behind that thread of 15 students, which is fine, but this is an example of resource contention, right? It could happen over here also. <laughs> uh, so, of course, if your threads are not independent, you still need to do some dependency checking uh, over here. So let me give you an overview of what's coming next. Modern GPUs are actually fine-grained multi-threaded machines. This is an early NVIDIA core. If you look over here, you have huge storage, a lot of registers for different thread contexts. Uh, and you can execute groups of 32 threads that share an instruction stream. Each group is called a warp. We will see that later. And they all execute the same instruction on different 
data. But the more important thing over here is up to 32 warps or thread groups, well, thread group may not be a good name here, uh, uh, batch of threads can be interleaved in this fine-grained multi-thread manner. You fetch from one, in the next cycle you fetch from the next one, in the next cycle you fetch from the next one, dot, dot, dot. And in the end, you have a huge machine that has lots and lots and lots of threads that are interleaved this way in a fine-grained multi-thread manner. And that's the end of fine-grained multi-threading. If you would like to learn more, these are Burton Smith's papers, and they're beautiful papers. Okay, have a nice weekend, and I'll see you, I guess, next week, right? Okay, take care.